This is the 2023 Trek Fuel EXE, super light and super quiet electric mountain bike. In this video, I'll give you a more detailed look into the bike. I'll show you around the bike in super high quality from this uh, 4K camera, 60 frames per second. Just makes everything look real sharp and you get a really good visual representation of the bike itself. So let's have a look around. And then I've got loads of questions that you guys sent through. Thanks so much for those. Maybe a little bit different to traditional Trek. It's a little bit more curvy, the tubes. It's got a bit more of a softer profile to it rather than sharp, clean lines. This is a bit more rounded. There we go, that lovely sun over there. That is banging. That is so good. Right, these carbon bars, RSL carbon bars, they're lovely, they look really nice. If they fit you, that's fantastic. Really wide. It's good that they're 820 mil wide because you can cut them down to whatever size you want. Now, when bike brands put bars on that are like 780 or 760, you can't grow those bars. They look beautiful, they're really nice. They do feel pretty stiff to me and the profile of them, the rise isn't quite high enough. Now, because this is like a press bike, it's cut really short there. The stem, the steerer tube is cut quite short because actually it looks more aesthetically pleasing in the photos, but when you buy it, you get a higher stack on there. So you can actually run these bars a bit higher. Now the mode controller is so neat, so tactile. It's one of those that it's just nice to press. You get good feedback from it. There's a click and a little beep, and that is perfect. And I know it sounds really sad and we're talking about buttons, but that little beep and that tactile piece of feedback you get when you're riding and you don't want to look down for a controller button, you can just feel it. It's rubberized, it's nice texture on there. And the click is really tactile and you can hear the beep. It's really simple little things that make the difference when you're riding. Now these are so handy. This is the Bontrager Bits tool. It's really useful for moving bars, moving, oh, it's a multi-tool, you know what they're good for, but so handy having it in there. Okay, display is really contrast rich. So it's super easy to see everything's really, really big. I think I said in my actual video that it'd be nice to see like a color LED on there. It's absolutely fine. I'm being really picky because this is a premium bike. As you can see from the riding position, this is kind of where I'd be sat. My head would be around here. It's really easy to see. It's really high contrast. And then you've got the button here that will take you through the different screens. So I've got distance, battery, remain in time, which changes with the mode. So if I change it to mode two, time goes down to 2.36 and then turbo, the time will go down to 2.01. Now I have dialed in the settings a little bit to um, dial everything up. Rock shocks with the new Charger 3 damper and the buttercups. Did notice I'm using quite a lot of the travel. I think I'm more in the last third of the travel. So I'm gonna play around with the rebound damping a little bit more. But look at that. Doesn't that look absolutely stunning from the front? It looks so good. Bontrager carbon rims. They're really light actually. I think the entire wheel set is under 1,800 grams. The tires on there, the 2.5 SE5s, they're really comfortable trail tire. 2.4s really do suit this bike as well with a little bit more edge profile, but it is good they haven't put on a really weak, weedy cross-country tire. They're actually proper trail tires and yeah, you can, you can ride pretty hard on them. Let's just go around this side because this sunset is just about to pop. Oh, look at that. Okay, TQ motor, super small, tiny, tiny, like, look at it. Absolutely miniature little profile down there. The shock is a 205 by 60. You can definitely put coils in. On the press camp, one of the Trek guys was running a coil in his. You can also put a 160 fork on it as well. The suspension performance of the rear is really good, actually. You could put a 27.5 inch wheel in the rear and run it as a mullet and then you can pop the flip chip in high to try and maintain the geometry. Some small details that you might not have seen. This is like a little mud flap, just minimizes the amount of stuff that gets flicked in there. Just little bits of detail. You see through here, there's a bit of metal on the um, chainstay and that stops the brake disc rubbing on the carbon when you put in the rear wheel in. It's a very small detail, but it's just nice to have that because it's easy to scratch carbon on the inside, when you're putting the wheel in, the rotor can scratch it 
and it's nice that they've taken the uh, time to, they didn't need to do that, but they've just put a little bit of metal there, a little plate that's kind of countersunk into the carbon to stop it rubbing on it when you're putting the wheel in. Neat. I do really like this. This is the Axis and it's a uh, battery. It's like a fake battery that's powered from the uh, internal battery. So you never have to remember to charge this. I know it's a small thing, but it's one less battery to charge. And it's not wireless because it's wired to the battery, but there's no connection between the shifter and this. It's all Bluetooth. If the main battery dies and you run out of power for the uh, motor, they've left about 200 shifts worth of axis shifting in that battery. So you don't have to worry about being stuck in the same gear if you run out of the main battery because they've uh, they thought about that as well. The cockpit is super clean, isn't it? Nice and minimalist. Nothing going on on there, just very, very slick. Just pop around here. The code breaks, by the way, RSCs are fantastic. They're so powerful. The reach adjust is great. Now it's set up with 200 mil rotors, the SRAM HS2 rotors, which are nice and thick. And paired with those code RSC brakes, you've got phenomenal braking power on this bike. All of this is like padded with like a battery protector. It's a nice rubberized protector all the way down. So any stone flicks are just minimized and damped by this. Then you've got the battery screw number one there and a second battery screw here. It's lovely, isn't it? When you can ride until half past nine, it's still light. Got views for miles and miles and miles all the way over to Wales, just over there. I love Britain in the summer, it's so good. So let's move on to your questions. There's loads that have come through on Instagram, thanks for sending. There were some real common themes. Now, first off was probably the most popular, which was how does it compare to two bikes, the Levo SL and the Orbea Rise. So compared to both of those bikes, the geometry on this is far more suited to faster and harder trail riding. In fact, the head angle on this bike is actually slacker than what they say. I've got two angle measurement devices and it measures about 64.3 degrees with the flip chip in low on my angle measurers, which is pretty slack for a trail bike. So the geometry is pretty aggressive with that slack head angle. Also the rear suspension on this is superb. It works really well. And I think this is more suited if you like faster, harder charging. I actually think you could do some enduro tracks on this as well, no problem. So compared to the Levo SL, which was released a couple of years ago now, that reach maxes out at about 480 something. It's not that long in XL. This is 510 thereabouts. So it's a lot longer, it's a lot slacker, but that doesn't mean it's a one trick pony. It pedals really well with the seat angle and the motor assistance. Now, compared to the Orbea Rise, it's a similar story. I would say the Orbea and the Levo SL in terms of geometry, a very similar 66-ish degree head angle, which is good for a lot of scenarios. But if you like having geometry that's a little bit more capable for some steeper stuff, then this is more suited to that. Now, in terms of power, it's more powerful than the Levo SL. It's not massive. It's not night and day difference. You don't get on this and think, whoa, that's super powerful. It's not like a full fat electric mountain bike but it's definitely more powerful. And what I have noticed is the power is applied quite low down right through the RPM range. So it's not like you need to get spin into a certain cadence for that power to be available, which is the case on the Orbea Rise and is I think the case on the Levo as well. So to me, I think both of those bikes, you need to spin a little bit more for the power to become available, whereas this makes it available throughout the cadence range. It's definitely not quite as punchy as the Orbea Rise if you use it in turbo mode. That has a 60 Newton meter motor. The Shimano is capable of about 500 watts at peak. Not quite sure Orbea fully use that 500 watts, but this is 300 watts, so it's not quite as punchy. But again, on the rise, it really likes a high cadence. So it wants you to spin a lot to get that motor performance. In terms of the motor noise, there's no contest. This is so stealth going up and down. There's no whine or clatter. The Levo SL has 
a motor wind when you're going up. It can be a little bit off-putting, a little bit distracting. Going down, it's fairly silent. There's a little bit of motor noise. Whereas the Orbea Rise is pretty quiet under power. It's not silent. It's definitely nowhere near the levels of this. But going down, it is, like most EP8 powered bikes, pretty clattery. It's that gear backlash in that EP8 motor that just creates a distracting rattle. Once you've ridden a super quiet bike like this, you can really notice it when you go on one of the other ones. Even my rail is just, in comparison, really loud, like really loud and rattly. So hopefully that gives you a little bit more clarification on the power. A few people have asked how to remove the battery. Super quick and easy. There's two Allen bolts. I'll just take this one off. It's pretty tightly tucked in there. I mean, it's it's so small. It amazes me every time I see this battery. Really small and really light. If anyone's interested, um, the voltage is 50.4 volts of this battery. 6.8 amp hours. Yeah, super small. And what you can do is they actually put a little plate on here and you just transfer it and you pop it in here and you can screw this plate on and you can ride it without the battery. Now, I'm not quite sure why you would because it's an e-bike and I don't know, I never see the appeal of riding an e-bike without a battery. Maybe if you're traveling, that might be an option. You can fly with it, take that main battery out, put a range extender and just bolt the plate back on. Now, a little fun fact, I rode it for two and a half hours with no motor power was not deliberate. I swapped the rear wheel and I forgot to put the magnet back on and I took it in my van to a nice location for some drone stuff. Got out, rode it for three pedal cycles, gave me an error and I'm like, oh no, I forgot on the magnet and I thought I was going to bail out. I thought, no, I'm not going to do this. But I rode it for two and a half hours to get some drone shots and it actually pedals okay. Obviously the motor is much better, but you can ride it no problem without the battery. Rob, can you confirm the actual weights? Because there's a lot of different weights quoted online. This one here, in XL, without pedals on my scales, weighed 18.6 kilos. And that is around 200 grams within Trek's quoted weight. I think they probably weigh a medium. Now the lightest is actually the XTR version, which is quoted at 17.47 kilos. And the reason that is lighter, the Axis droppers, they weigh quite a bit. The uh, Axis rear mechs, and they're heavier than like an XTR. The cassette, the XTR cassette, super light, and it doesn't have like the air whiz or the tire whiz. Now, removing all of the wireless stuff and all the tech um, actually saves incredibly around a kilo. So the XTR version is 17.47 kilos. In XL, it probably weighs about 17.6, something like that. That is pretty impressive. And there's a few other questions about which one is the one to go for. Now, I actually think the 9.8 XT is the one to go for especially in the UK. And the reason for that is because it's cheaper than the GX version, but it is actually lighter than this build here. Still comes with the carbon rims, XT drivetrain instead of um, GX or Axis. XT brakes, all that kit is really good performing. So you basically get this bike here with the same rims, same carbon frame, full carbon frame, but with full Shimano XT. <laughs> and like I said, it's lighter than this bike and it's cheaper. Now that doesn't usually happen. Normally, the more you spend, um, the lighter the bike is, but that one's like over 4,000 pounds cheaper than this and it's lighter and the XT kit is really decent. So I think the 9.8 XT is the one to get. And I saw the black color, it's smoke. It looks really sweet. I really like that one. So that would be my um, recommendation um, if you want something that I think price to performance ratio is ticking that box. I think the 9.8 XT, yeah, is the one to go for. So the next up, you're allowed one bike only, full fat Trek rail or the new Trek Fuel. If I could only pick one bike, I still really like the full fat e-bike. I, I like riding a lot with people with full power e-bikes. And whilst you could do it on here, you probably need to be super, super fit to be able to spend the entire day riding with full fat e-bikes. So pretty much for that reason, I ride a lot in groups and they all ride full fat bikes. I like the power that they give. I like how quickly you can get to the top of the hill. Don't like the weight so much on a lot of things. I think the dream would be a full fat e-bike at like 19-ish kilos, wouldn't it? You get the best of both then. But yeah, I think for one, if I could only have one, it would still be the full fat, the Trek rail. 
There's a few people that's asked how it's actually mounted because you can't see any bolting hardware. I think that's actually a compliment to the design team because yeah, it, it does look quite seamless. From this side, you can't really see any, any bolts, but there is one on the other side. I'll show you a clip so you can see how it's mounted, but it's very difficult to see because it's kind of hidden in this bottom bracket area just here. Can you over fork it and over shock it? Definitely, you can go to a 160 fork, no problem. Trek say that. It's warranted for a 160. I've actually got from RockShox a 160 air shaft that I need to put in here. Now with the rear, this is a 205 by 60, so the shaft size is um, 60 mil. You could probably remove a spacer from this and run it at 62.5, certainly in the XL size. Not tried it. I am curious to try it. I'm going to probably put in a 230 by 62.5 shock. So you get a little bit of extra travel. Maybe it will be around like a 160, 150. Not that you need to. I just want to try it and see how it works. So you can definitely do it to the fork within warranty. I wouldn't advise changing this because it will probably invalidate the warranty if you have a problem. But, you know, there's a lot of people that like to tinker, me included. I like to have a play around and yeah, I'd like to try like a coil, 62.5 mil stroke coil to give around 150 rear wheel travel. Yeah, that'd be good. I think, yeah, shall I do an enduro type video with a 160 fork and a coil shock just to see? I think it would be quite a good enduro weapon that you could create. Will it keep up with your mates when everyone is out together on a full fat or will it lag behind? I've ridden it with full fat e-bikes. I definitely needed to use more turbo. Um, I'm not massively fit. If you are a really fit rider, you're lighter weight. I'm like 85, 87 kilos in riding gear. So I'm a little bit slower on this bike unless I put it in turbo. You would be able to keep up, not for the entire day, and you'd need to be light and fit. Otherwise, you're going to rinse the battery. It's only a 360 watt hour battery, and a lot of full fats have over double that. Um, so yeah, I don't... I wouldn't recommend it if you ride in groups with full fat e-bikes, unless there's a few of you that are on the super lights and a few on full fats, and then, you know, people kind of wait for you. Future firmware upgrade to allow to adjust rear wheel size to 27.5. So just to add a little bit to that, um, you can mullet this bike. So you can put a 27.5 inch rear wheel and you can uh, change the flip chip to maintain the geometry to a certain extent now. At the moment, if you do that, it does get an incorrect reading uh, from the Speedo because you've got a different size rear wheel and there's no software yet to allow you to change the rear wheel. So the Speedo gets the accurate reading. Now I did reach out to TQ. They are hoping that at some point in the near future, you will be able to change the firmware to tell it it's got a 27.5 inch rear wheel. That would be via a dealer service tool and they'll be able to update it. No guarantees as to exactly when that might be, but um, they are aware of it and it's something that they're going to try and roll out. There's a few people that said, is this bike really as good as everyone says? Is it a game changer? Uh, game changer is used a lot, isn't it? In <laughs> marketing speak for electric mountain bikes. Certainly it's a game changer for Trek. I think if I was to use that phrase game changer, the thing for me is the motor noise and the experience that you get when you ride it because Riding something like this and then getting on another e-bike, they are poles apart. They're so different in, in the ride experience that you get. So my expectation now for every new motor that comes out is just, it has to be quiet, like going up and going down. It, yeah, that box has to be ticked. It is possible, TQ have done it. It needs to be quiet. No more rattles and whines and all of this kind of stuff. That That's in the past now. This is the new standard in terms of riding experience. The way that the software delivers power is super pleasant. Look how clean the front is. I mean, it's like there's nothing going on up there. The remote control, I'm so bored of complaining in videos about remote controls. I just think it should be a given that on a £10,000 high tech, like we're talking high tech stuff here, you shouldn't have the Starship Enterprise as a controller on your electric mountain bike. These companies should be figuring this stuff out already. But when you've got a bike that has this kind of level of integration, the quiet motor, now actually designing stuff to be simple is actually uh, quite difficult, but this is really the master of minimalism and simplicity. The remote has two buttons on it. You don't need any more. There's one button here to scroll through, toggle through the display. 
so game changer um yeah i think so i think i think it is fair to call it a game changer in terms of the complete package the electronic system and certainly for trek it's a game changer because hey look we've got an 18 kilo 18 and a half kilo super quiet electric mountain bike that no one knows like nobody knows that this is an e-bike is there enough power uphill Yes, but it's definitely not full power. You cannot just blast over stuff. So on technical climbs, with uh, full power e-bikes, you can just use the motor to blast through things. This has not got that full power, that punch to blast over everything. So you need more rider skill, a bit more finesse, a bit more body language to actually like get up it, maneuver the bike up and over. But if you're just talking long, slow grinds, then yeah, totally. It's got 300 watts. So, you know, if you're able to put out 250 watts, 300 watts as well, you know, that's 600 watts that you're pushing out, which is basically a super athlete. So yes, this has definitely got enough power to go uphill, but the riding style is gonna be a little bit different for uphill technical sections. So I wouldn't see this in the EWS E for some of those power stages, for example, because it's just not that type of bike. There's quite a few people talking about range. Now range is so different for everybody, but typically on this bike, if I was to ride it in this local terrain that I'm in now, which is, pretty hilly loads of like punchy climbs it's easy to do a thousand foot you know you can find many hills that are just a constant thousand foot climbs um on this bike i would get around 750 meters so vertical elevation is probably the easiest way to compare because flat you can just ride forever basically on most e-bikes but vertical elevation around 750 meters which is around two and a half thousand feet roughly um, if you dial it down a little bit, you're going to get about a third more in the middle mode and about another third more on top of that at my weight. And around 90 minutes to two hours of riding. But like I said, it is more up and then down here, up and then down. There's less traversing. If I was on full power on more flat terrain, I'd probably be having longer rides. Maybe those two hour rides would be three hours, three and a half hours. But I might not get that same elevation. So yeah, with the 360 watt internal battery, I was getting around 750 vertical meters in the highest power mode. It's a good question that's come up next actually, which was um, if you were to buy a spare, would you buy a range extender or an internal battery? The internal battery is super small. You could definitely carry that in a backpack. Like it's um, 1.8 kilos. That's not a lot at all. Saying that it is still 1.8 kilos on your back. So for me, it'd have to be the range extender because it's already on the bike. The center of gravity is lower. It's an extra 160 watt hours. So you're getting another 40% in range. And I think that's enough, actually. I think, yeah, I think that and the range extender would be 40% extra range. That's um, that, that would do me totally. Although if I really wanted to go on super long rides, I can see having a spare one of these would be useful. I hate carrying backpacks personally. I like to have everything on the bike, tools, water, like as much as I can stash on the bike. I just like to be like my back free and just have a shirt on. So I would totally go for the range extender in the bottle, keeps it on the bike. You can still ride without a backpack and still get more range. Power delivery, smooth like a Levo or more punchy like a Bosch system. Definitely smooth definitely smooth no spikes in power very little overrun if any overrun it's so smooth there's no kind of specific characteristic that i could pull out to tell you that's how it feels like other than it feels like you are a superhuman pedaling it because you can't hear it you just go faster it's just smooth power delivery from the get-go from the moment you put pressure on it smooth right until the cutoff and as soon as you hit that motor cutoff it's just smooth over that and you can pedal it way over that cutoff speed you don't get to the limit and think oh that's annoying you just carry on pedaling and you just carry on going it's a beautifully engineered motor it is super smooth really natural feeling and a pleasure to ride if i didn't manage to answer your specific question pop it down below and i'll read your comment and i'll try and answer it and thanks for watching subscribe for more e-bike stuff and i'll catch you soon